Good morning. My name is Mark Lichty, and I'm chair and co-founder of Active Surveillance Patients International. And I want to welcome, uh, well, Jenny and Donovan and Freddie Hamdy here primarily because they are the awardees. But I want to welcome all of you pioneers, all of you pioneers that have gone on this active surveillance journey, which due to the work that Jenny and Donovan and about 1,600 patients took on, we learned that active surveillance was pretty much just as safe as treatment. And when I was diagnosed 20 years ago, we didn't know that. We didn't have a clue. We we went on active surveillance uh, with the concern that, well, maybe, maybe we're going to die anyway. And it's interesting to see the evolution of even the term active surveillance. When when I was diagnosed, I was it was it was actually called watchful waiting. They hadn't even invented the term active surveillance, and I didn't like that term watchful waiting. It was like you're waiting to die. <laughs> so then then along came active surveillance, and I, I like that better. And, <laughs> and and what what we're about what ASP I is uh, about is peaceful vigilance. We, we uh, I believe that all of you with low and intermediate risk prostate cancer can find peace here. You don't have to panic every time you get a PSA test or an MRI or whatever. I mean, I don't even I don't even think about prostate cancer after 20 years. And you all, we believe all of you can achieve that. And that's very much in line with the the issue of your quality of life. We we try to do what we can to support your own quality of life, creating balance in your life. Uh, I'm grateful to my father, too, by the way, who uh, died of prostate cancer. But in his death, he left a message for me. And that was not to get treated because I watched him in his last year of life and he was overtreated, and the quality of his life in his last year was destroyed. And but for dad, I would have gotten treated. And so I, I'm grateful for that. And I don't, there's a lot of fo folks that are going to be talking this morning, so I don't want to talk more. I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words later about the award itself. I, I'm, I do want to say too, I, I'm, this is, what we're doing right now with uh, Freddie and Jenny is the most important work I do with Active Surveillance Patients International because it, it honors me to give this award because through giving this award and through getting this message out, we're going to reach even more men than we have reached. So it's a, a great honor for me. And with with that, I would like to introduce you, who uh, has an interesting story too. Thank, Thank you, Mark, uh, and, and beautifully, beautifully put, beautifully said. Um, yeah, my I didn't realize you had that story with your father. I had a similar story with my father, um, who was uh, who I watched, um, you know, go through a, a very very sort of sad decline um uh, he died at 70 um and when my cousin was diagnosed aged my, my father's brother's first uh, only son was diagnosed in his 50s um my father's brother um died from heart disease so he, he didn't get to the point where he could be uh where it was going to be a uh, going to be a, a a thing for him, um, I sort of went down a, <clears throat> you know, I went down a sort of a journey whereby once a year, uh, it, it, it was it was wise for me to be tested, and sure enough, age fifty eight, which was uh, six years ago, um, I I got a, a diagnosis, um, and um, which was a three plus four uh, diagnosis, and um, was about to embark on on treatment. It's, I think, a little bracket here. I would just say that because I speak to a lot of guys, you know, I, I, I was, 
I literally was descended upon by an angel, um, but by the, the most generous person, a uh, generous guy who had done huge, huge amounts of research. And what he did was he got me up to speed in a very, very short space of time. He got me up to speed with what everything meant. And what I what I deal with on a, on a weekly basis, I probably speak to a, a newly diagnosed uh, a man newly newly diagnosed with prostate cancer on a weekly basis because <clears throat> I've got a lot of friends. I'm lucky enough to have a lot of friends, and every friend of mine's got a friend who's just been diagnosed. I'm 64 now, so I'm in that sort of sweet spot where people are getting diagnosed. And to a man, when 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 most of the of the guys that I know get diagnosed, there's this. It, it's like they've been hit by a brick. They've, they've hit been hit by a brick wall because all of a sudden, um, they they are they are, they get thrown into a panic. You know, it's just and 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 there's just there's there's confusion. There's a tendency for them to you know just do what the first person tells them to do. Um, to rush into treatment. To want to sort of rid themselves of this issue. Um, and I I refer back to 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 um six years ago when i when i was diagnosed and i had that sort of feeling about oh my goodness you know uh, and then was lucky enough as i said to have been able to have a conversation with a um a guy who had done huge amounts of research before he made the decision he made which was actually to have treatment he did actually go ahead and have treatment but he was very very close to an active surveillance journey and to cut a long story short i i um I I decided not to go ahead and have the radiotherapy. I was I was um, I was on target to have. Um, I did have a second and third opinion on the biopsy, and um, the second and third opinion came back um, with a, a, a three plus three diagnosis. Um, the, the original one had been three plus four, so um, I felt um, and not only did this chap. Um, you know, give me access to all his incredible information. But he also introduced me to a guy called Peter Scardino. I don't know if you've ever heard of Peter, who is at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he just was the most lovely man. And he just, you know, he said, just send me your sides and we'll have a look. And 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 um, and Peter had a look and he said, well, we're saying three plus three. So I'm going to send him to my mate, Jonathan Epstein, and he can have a look too. So, I mean, I I was just... I didn't know any of these people, and I was, and I, and it, it became clear that I was being treated and being given advice on the house by some of the most extraordinary sort of front runners in the field. Wow. Um, so I decided to go on to active surveillance, and and um, six years later, I'm still on it. And 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 actually, the biopsy I had in November, um, the bi, I'm, 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 the biopsy I had in no, last November, which is five and a half years later. Um, indicated that um that that they could only they could only find one small tumor one tumor of less than one millimeter in length and and um, and there'd been three originally so that was quite interesting and and actually both mark and howard and bill all have a similar story now yeah. all of us guys have you know the luck enough to to be able to say not only we have we been stable for 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 the years we've been doing it, but we've actually seen ourselves get better, get a bit better. And if if we you know if the biopsy is telling us what what what's what is actual 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 fact, um, and so I just I just feel immensely grateful for the fact that you guys were doing this pioneering work, and that as a result of you doing it as a result of you doing all that work and 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 for 25 years and and for the the information just beginning to you know because i would imagine you some of the, your findings and your tell us will have been shared probably as 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 you went on the journey you know and as a result of our lovely urology urologists sort of becoming more and more au fait with this as a possible route um you know i've gone down that route and i've had you know six years of uninterrupted living you know as a result of not having to take the risk of having treatment so what can i say about thank well you so done. much congratulations you've made the right decisions absolutely <laughs> thank you so much yeah thank you i guess i can jump in now i'm uh howard walinski one of the co-founders of uh 
Active Surveillance Patients International, going back to 2017. And I've been on uh, this so-called journey for 14 years. And uh, Hugh, a moment ago, expressed gratitude. And I think that that's the theme for today. This is a moment for reflection and gratitude. It isn't often that we as patients, and I, I'm, I'm getting choked up here, um, can thank the very people whose hard work and vision dramatically have changed our lives for the better through, through research. They provided a foundation for those of us who are advocates and advocate and a, activists to present a story to a public that probably used to be far more skeptical about the idea of living with a cancer. Mm. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Jim Monte for taking time from his vacation in northern Michigan for joining us. He's founding co-director of the Michigan Urologic Surgery Improvement Collaborative, better known as MUSIC, thank God, which showed that active surveillance, once a novel, mainly academic cancer management technique, could spare patients with low to favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer from unnecessarily aggressive treatments and their side effects. Now, Michigan's my former home, go blue, as we say. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was a journalist in uh, residence at the University of Michigan, where I studied international health issues and that sort of thing. And thanks to J Jim's efforts and those of his colleagues, they've shown that it's possible, even in a capitalistic state, although I have to say some people living in Michigan think that it's a uh, radical lefty state, <laughs> it's possible to generate active surveillance rates comparable to those in Sweden and the United Kingdom with uh, nationalized health systems. I had the privilege last year of going to Grand Rapids, Michigan to present ASPE's first special award for advocacy and research to the music group. So thanks to Drs. Monty, Miller, Ghani, Ginsburg, uh, George and Morgan, and I'm probably forgetting a hundred others. Uh, thanks for to the innovative and visionary work of an insurance company, no less, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Thanks to them for covering the birth of my first son, and also for their emphasis on research and the quality of care. May may their tribe increase. I'll I'll ask Dr. Monty to comment now on on music, the award, and Drs. Hamdi and Donovan and their groundbreaking work and how it helped re-steer the conservative medical system in the mid in the mitten state to actively uh, monitoring or surveilling um, prostate cancer. So Dr. Monty, the floor is yours. Um, just to provide a little context, when I was a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering in, in 1978, and uh, Dr. Shellhammer, who's uh, a, a certainly a great innovator in prostate cancer care, is on the line as well. He was there He's much older than I am, so he was there a few years before I was. But Dr. Whitmore recognized that many prostate cancers were very indolent and uh, that other factors were much more dangerous to the patient. Um, but that evolved, uh, in, as Dr. Handy said, in the 90s to the consideration of uh, active surveillance. Um, on behalf of music, I would certainly like to congratulate Dr. Hamdi and uh, Ms. Donovan and the entire Protec T team. Uh, team. Um, I think the Protec T trial uh, is one of the most, if not the most, influential trial that's been done in the history of urology. Uh, that's the, the number of people that are going to be impacted by this trial. And it certainly provided the data that um, enabled the implementation of music uh, to now consistently have 80 to 90% of low-risk patients going on initial active surveillance. 
uh, in a real world practice setting. So um, it's a tremendous accomplishment uh, that they did. And I remember, I, I remember, I can't remember the exact year, but it was when your first New England Journal paper came out, Freddie, yeah. that you were a visiting professor at, at uh, U of M then. 2016. And uh, it, yeah. it, the timing was perfect. So uh, congratulations to the whole Protect Team trial. It's a marvelous accomplishment. Certainly one of the best performed trials uh, that's been done. It was marvelously conceived and, and executed. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Monty, thank you. I'll take the floor again for a moment. I, I am grateful to Ivor Thomas. He was a hospital architect by day and a performance poet by night who... I declared in my newsletter, theactivesurveillor.com, was the poet laureate of prostate cancer. We long needed one, and Ivor, I'm grateful. Ivor was one of the 1,643 patients in the PROTECT trial. He even wrote a book of poems about the experience. It's called The Body Beautiful. It has a glorious cover with photo of the many stitches Ivor had following his surgery. <laughs> he obviously wasn't in the active monitoring group. And I don't think he really appreciated it until he talked to uh, Mark, Bill, and me about our experiences. I don't think he understood what he had done. It's true he had those bitch and stitches, but uh, it was guys like him were willing not only to go on monitoring, but also to undergo surgery or radiation and show the safety of active surveillance. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, he, he helped lead the way and didn't even know it. I think he was totally uh, gobsmacked. I think that's what you people say by the fact that uh, how he had changed our lives. You know, Mark and uh, Bill and me have all been on active surveillance for roughly 15 to 20 years, never treated. So Ivor uh, made a difference and he didn't even know it. And we are grateful. And Ivor will now perform one of his works. And, th and thank you, Ivor. With, <clears throat> thank you for that uh, introduction, Howard, and it's a wonderful honour to be joining you people here today, and special congratulations to Freddie. I mean, his leadership has been absolutely exemplary, and the group he founded, Jenny to the forefront, of course, have been a real support and help to me. Uh, as you hinted, Howard, it's just Jenny and me in the room who haven't got any prostates, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, I took that decision uh, back in 20 years ago uh, to go through a, a radical prostectomy. Um, certainly, my thinking was shaped by the sort of common currency then you have to treat cancer early, you've got to deal with it, you've got to get rid of it, and that was sort of driving my thinking. Um, and also, I'm a, very much a, an internal locus of control sort of guy. So I wanted to make sure that I'd eliminated any imponderables and uncertainties. Um, due to the uh, wonderful surgery performed on me by Howard Kiniston, who was the Cardiff um, preeminent uh, prostate surgeon uh, in Cardiff at the time, despised robotics, um, uh, I, uh, I'm here to tell the tale. And on Saturday, I'll be running an ultra marathon of 100 kilometers. So um, uh, <laughs> uh, but really speaking to Howard and getting introduced to the group. I mean, my son now, he's um, he's coming up to the, well, he's 40-ish. Uh, so, you know, this question will be posed to him at some stage, I guess. And certainly I, I've got much better advice to give him now than I, uh, than the, uh, than I was placed to to be in in uh, 20 years ago so thank you to the group um 
Thank you again to Freddie Jenny. Wonderful award for Freddie. It's terrific that he should be so recognized. Um, and um, to sum summarize the sort of uncertainty and the fear that um, someone experiences uh, when being first diagnosed, I'd like to read to you now new questions. <coughs> uh, this, um, uh, I'll just read it. New questions. Sister Vivian, researcher, shows me the medical illustrations. It's as foreign as a map of Glasgow or Leeds. She tests my knowledge. I know all this, but not now. This isn't my city. I'm lost. She tells me how difficult diagnosis is, how imponderable treatment. There are forms to sign, questionnaires to complete, consents and blood to be given. Do I understand? Will I participate? We sit together alone in the disused hospital. This was once the A&E department. I came here with my children. Their cuts and broken bones were tended in a cubicle such as this. I remember a nurse. His name was Mal. I puzzle over this theme park, park bladder like a boating lake the sweeping cycle path of the urethra, the country lane of the rectum, the racetrack of the penis, the car park of the prostate. Like all car parks, it's difficult to get to. For a moment, I'm glad that these things are foreign to me, that I'm not an expert, that all this is unexplored territory. When I am chemo-whacked and zapped by x-rays, I will know these byways like the IV stabbed back of my hand will have conducted guided tours, allowed visitors, memorabilia and takeaways. Then my gray, gray skin face will nod the answers to her questions. Thank you so much to the group. Many congratulations well, to thank our you, great, well, great. Great. Okay, now I'm going to do a little bit of uh, introduction of our honorees, and Mark will explain and present the award. Um, doctors uh, Hamdi and Donovan were the principal investigators of the Landmark Protect study. Dr. Hamdi is the Nutfield Professor of Surgery, Professor of Urology, and head of the new New, sorry, Newfield Department of Surgical Services at the University of Oxford. King Charles III recently uh, picked Dr. Hamdi to be a commander of the British Empire. He doesn't quite earn the honor of being called Sir, or have, I don't think he'll have uh, swords placed on his shoulders, but uh, we, we call him Sir, and we honor and respect him. Uh, we hope that the ASPE award, which is visible between you and uh, Dr. Donovan, uh, will be right up there with uh, with the Medal of Honor that you get from the King. Thank you, Dr. Hamdi. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Donovan is Professor of Clinical Epidemiology and Deputy Head of the Bristol Medical School and he Head of uh, Population Health Sciences. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Dr. Donovan was recognized by the real monarch, Queen Elizabeth. She, uh, Jenny was is an officer of the British Empire. I don't know who's the boss, but uh, we're, we're honored that you're both here. And right now in my advanced age, I'm a master's degree student in a public health program at the University of Illinois in Chicago, as well as being on active surveillance and being an activist and advocate. I can attest to how Dr. Donovan and her team's multidisciplinary approach contributes to significant healthcare improvements and policy change around the world. Thank you, uh, Dr. Donovan. Mark, the floor is back to you. Thank you, Howard. I wanted to to mention that um, we 
we were presented this uh, nomination by Mike Scott. And Mike, thank you so much because it was so well deserved. Most of us overlooked that, but you were perceptive enough to know how important the Protect study was. And uh, we gave Mike the Throne Torvaldson Patient Advocacy Award yesterday. And basically, Mike did a primer on active surveillance, which anybody that's considering active surveillance should look at. And so that'll be up in about four or five days. Now, let me speak for a moment about the award. Uh, Freddie and Jenny, I'm so glad to see that the award is not hanging in your closet. It's actually hanging <laughs> on the wall. Thank you. So when when I designed this award, I had a dear friend who was an artist do, do the hands. But the message, uh, keep, oh, I guess you're not going to be able to keep that up because I'm talking. <laughs> Well, let, let me just say that uh, on the, the award, uh, we have the importance of patient-doctor communication. On one thumb is the patient, and on the other thumb is the doctor. And what, what we've learned in the past 20 years is how important shared decision-making is. And now the doctors are really open to shared decision making. And so patients should never have fear about that. About It's all about humility. It's all about the way we present things. And most every doctor that I ever spoke with is totally open to shared decision making. And hence, and hence the hands. And that's, that's why the hands were, were incorporated into this. A very quick word to say how deeply honored and moved and touched by this award. It really touches the heart of what we've been doing um, over so many decades. And it is so, so rewarding. You know, it really is better than anything that we have ever received before because it comes from you. Um, it's not coming from other professionals or or even the king, to be honest. So and I mean that it's it's really this is these are heartfelt words and i know jenny feels exactly the same yeah. so so thank you it's, yeah so touched to have this award yeah. it's just been amazing yeah absolutely fantastic. When, when, when howard uh, sent sent us this email um and i hadn't been in touch with you for a while howard and uh, my first um my first reaction was to be moved and deeply touched by that mm -hmm. um uh, because you, you you know we we've done this work it's become it's gone into our dna day in day out for so many years and we tend to um just not not regard it as special or um or, or seen seen by others so to get this from the very heart of the people that we care about and that is the patients was very very special for us mm -hmm. um really special thank you yeah.